will hear up here, taking in the feedback which is coming from the community. So the protocols also need some enhancements so that they are not outdated and they are in line with the latest DHIS versions which are used in country. Technology, um, of course, is the most expensive thing that we have, apart from the people and building their capacities. So you need to understand that whenever you're investing in technology, you need to ensure that it is for long term and sustainable for uh, sustainable infrastructure and a continuous needs assessment needs to be carried out so that you have gap identification after every few years and so that you can plan the investments in the same way that you're not investing only on the people and the processes, but technology also plays a key role. As we have seen in many details implementations, as the scale grows up, you have to similarly increase your technical architecture and uh, infrastructure also. So next slide, please. But we've seen what makes a good DHS implementation, but how to actually measure it. It's very important for us to measure the different aspects that we spoke about, that we need to measure people's capacity. We need to measure the existence and sustenance of processes. And we need to also see how uh, the implementation is well supported by technology. Therefore, keeping all, all these areas into account, uh, the team that Global Fund, Oslo, and the schools work together to build a much more comprehensive toolkit, which has pinpoint questions against each of these categories, trying to understand where your implementation stands as of today, what are the key gaps that you see based on the assessment results, and how you can plan to improve your implementations moving forward through those ident problem identification steps, uh, problems identified, and what kind of interventions will need to resolve those problems. So basically the tool allows you to do kind of measuring your progress on systems running over time by measuring each of these individual components that we discussed. And then of course, until and unless you don't have your fixed priorities, your kind of long-term vision, it's difficult to buy funding. It's difficult to get funding or attention from the partners or the funding partners that we have in country. So you need to have uh, these uh, this homework done in, uh, in advance so that you can encourage investment in core DHS to capacity, which contributes to a sustainable implementation. And then, of course, you have multiple funding partners funding their own priority areas. But then each of the funding partners can also contribute to towards the core in the core uh, areas, which could be uh, uh, processes, which could be people, which could be technology. So you need to align all these segments together so that you have a coherent pool of funding, which again gets distributed into multiple streams, depending upon the priorities that, that the funding partner supports. Okay. So basically through this maturity framework, you can evaluate the readiness of where you are and what should you do in case you have plans to further scale in your DHIS2 implementation. So you get so the sample screenshot which you see, you see there are three components. So we'll take these components one by one. One is foundational, the second one is aggregate, third one is structured. So it's very important to set the foundation of your DHS system uh, well in advance and with good quality so that you can further build on by making it more comprehensive, moving to aggregate data collection, and then even going to uh, next final steps of introducing individual level data factors. Okay? So what the tool does is that it will measure and understand how the country is progressing for its health information system strengthening. And beyond just summarizing what the activities are being performed, because activities every country is doing, but then are those activities in line with your priorities and in line with your actual problem and actual needs? That needs to be understood, and uh, your implementation plans need to undergo a change so that you include the observations which are coming out of this tool. Next slide. Now the benefits uh, of using this tool are, uh, since it is getting endorsed by major funding partners, Global Fund Gavi, so they're trying to drive their funding decision based on the outcome of these assessments. So this is kind of trying to encourage investments into core DHS to capacity in the foundation areas, because we all want fancy things, of course, to work with, that we want aggregated, we want to move tracker, cap uh, to tracker, capture individual data, because it gives us an opportunity to do much more final analysis. But then, in order to be sustainable to do that, you need to ensure that your foundation aspects are well-funded and they're well-structured and well-organized. Okay? And then, through this particular assessment, you are you have an opportunity to align investment and donor interventions together. 
So I think uh, on day one, Ola in, a presentation, in his presentation discussed about making a big country work plan where you could have in all the activities that a country is supposed to do in the near future and then align those activities to donor priorities and kind of present that as a one big country work plan so that each donor can identify the areas where they can support because their priorities lies in those areas and then you could have one joint stream of funds which can be used for different areas together. But that only becomes visible when you do such an assessment and it gives you a picture of where we stand and what, it, uh, what we need to do further. Next slide. So yeah. Um, So yes, as I think I've already mentioned this, that what the majority framework does is to give you a good indication that where does the country stands and, and whether it is in a good position to scale up further, moving from aggregate to tracker and further finer details. So we can look at the uh, individual components now. In this slide, there are some recommendations which uh, we're trying to give, but they're not kind of uh, based in stone or cast in stone. Of course, the country can decide things on their own, but then there are some recommendations which we feel should be followed to be able to have sustainable implementations in place. Next slide, please. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, the tool measures the maturity in these three core areas. Uh, the first one is, the, we start from the bottom, uh, the foundational, where we talk about uh, the legislation and governance, the security infrastructure, um, uh, and facility and population profile. Uh, training of end users, uh, the quality of DHS to material and organization units, uh, having a core team in country, and uh, yeah. So these are the foundational aspects. Each of them has a set of questions which a country has to assess based on their current situation to try to address uh, the, uh, the current situation, that, the, that these foundation areas are currently not yet achieved or they're early progress or uh, they're adequate or mature, depending on the current situation. The same questions and the same scoring mechanism is followed for aggregate and for tracker as well. Next slide, please. So let's look at the foundational aspects. You see here, most of them are crucial for decision making. So you need to have a strong leadership and governance focusing on your digital health strategy, which includes DHIS2. Uh, you should have kind of dedicated mechanisms to uh, think of the strategy in terms of investment, in terms of having funding support. So you should know that how to reach out to different funding partners and to present your case in a way that it is convincing enough for them to fund interventions in your country. Then we come to the local needs where you need to have a core team uh, for DHS to maintenance. Uh, you need to think of security and compliance because you, have, you are managing starting with aggregate data, but it doesn't take much time for a country to start collecting individual level information as well. Metadata org units you understand are the kind of the bottom line for any DHS for instance, so they need to be of a good quality. Capacity building of users again is very important because they are the ones who will kind of bring life to your information system, so it's important that they're well trained. And facility and pro population profile kind of are your basic denominators without which you can't do your analysis and you can't measure the impact of interventions that you're going to do. And infrastructure, as I mentioned, is very important for you your implementations to uh, actually work on the field. So the recommendation here is that when you're looking at the foundational topics and when you do an assessment, if you see that uh, all your uh, foundation aspects are at least in early progress stage uh, and you're already using aggregate program. So before you plan to scale that, uh, just try that none of your foundational topics should be in not yet achieved. Okay? So if you see you're using aggregate data sets already for data collection, but on analysis of your uh, of your in-country situation based on the toolkit, you find that any of your uh, foundation areas is falling under not yet achieved, then we need to take a pause, rethink the strategy of how those areas could be strengthened before we scale things up uh, in, the, in the for the aggregate domain as well. Tracker, we all know. Uh, configuration, of course, is, is one thing, but then the actual implementation of Tracker is kind of a very large scale exercise which needs investments in terms of devices, in terms of trainings, in terms of uh, technology. So you need to make a very crucial decision of when switching from aggregate to Tracker that your foundational aspects and your aggregate domain uh, aspects are relatively stable before you can jump into collecting individual level information. 
So for ensuring that you are moving the right direction, you before implementing Tracker, you should have first of all the institutional buy-in and support from the key stakeholders. Okay? Since we're dealing with individuals' data, it's very important that we make conscious decisions in terms of what kind of data we're trying to collect and who all should have access to this data. These these principles should be defined well in advance. Funding again, you need funding for your DHS to configuration, you need funding for implementation, training, and continued support. So you should identify that whether funding is available for you to support this particular intervention or not. Okay. Again, as I spoke about individual data, so you have data privacy and uh, is, is, is the question which we need to answer and make sure that our systems align to that. And then uh, whatever data exchange standards are in place, which could be used potentially moving forward, so they should be thought of well in advance. Capacity and competence again, uh, it kind of is kind of depending on his group they're working because they do have the capacity and competence to, to work with you. But it's important that as the progress move happens in the implementation, the country core team also builds this capacity and competence so that they're not totally reliant on the his group support, but they are also self-reliant and can manage things and grow together with his group in terms of their own capacity. Infrastructure again, uh, we've already discussed with devices, internet availability, server user support. So the larger your scale, the better you should be prepared to handle the challenges which come uh, with infrastructure. So all these parameters if you take into account before moving into a track implementations, we, we have seen that things are relatively smoother uh, and you face less challenges uh, as you move ahead. So uh, the generic recommendation is uh, the foundation domains should be at least at early, pro early progress or adequate uh, before you move on to the uh, tracker implementations. And since we're talking about individual data, you should have enough security and compliance procedures followed for DHS to security. That should be at least adequate. So these are just generic recommendations. Of course, uh, there's nothing uh, to stop a country from using Tracker, but then just that you're well prepared and your implementations don't suffer or uh, challenges uh, as they go ahead. So it's better to be well prepared with the foundation activities and specifically the ones which focus on Tracker. Next slide, please. Yeah, so for, uh, again, for tracker systems, uh, it's not that you've just started the implementation and it will just work smoothly. As you saw in the case of Nepal HIV, the, the, the presenter discussed yesterday that just by designing the system and implementing it did not really solve their purpose. They had to focus on continuous improvements at all the levels, so they had to kind of inculcate the you the kind of the the main cause of why the users need to use the system so it's just that designing and implementing just doesn't stop there you need to continuously involve in terms of with people and as you see the program grows more you'll need more funding and more bud budgets to be put into place to introduce these individual data domains because you start with hiv then you think of the other two programs tb malaria and uh, things like COVID, which is, uh, can happen uh, without any previous information. So, I mean, you need to be well prepared and you need to make to ensure that you are continuously looking at the performance of and the gaps which are there in existing implementation, which could be of the three domains that we discussed. It could be gaps in the people's capacity, could be gaps in the processes, could be gaps in the infrastructure as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was my last slide. Uh, maybe we can quickly uh, show you the tool which is there. Currently, the maturity assessment is being done in the countries which are global fund eligible as per the data SA project and with the his hub is involved. But the countries are uh, kind of encouraged to use the same tool. So if you want your country implementation to be assessed using the DHS to maturity assessment toolkit, then you could reach out to your his group. They will definitely help out and work with you and uh, can, can facilitate detailed orientation of the toolkit and can also give examples of how they have done similar exercises in, um, in other countries. Okay. So if there are any questions, we can discuss those uh, or else I can just give a quick review of uh, the tool itself.
Yeah, so we there's a question on the online chat for regarding a tool for readiness assessment before doing a DHS implementation. So we have a session on that. So just after this assessment session, we will have a review of the readiness assessment tool as well. So uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, it's an Excel based uh, toolkit where there are several subdomains defined for different uh, areas. So you, for example, you start with leadership and governance. There are some guidelines given that how you can uh, assess this particular subdomain and if you if i move this to the right then you have these grades available not yet achieved early progress adequate and mature for each question you have a definition or description of the measuring criteria in terms of how can you grade this particular statement so if your uh, situation in the country matches any of these four, then you can grade yourself uh, or the country implementation uh, by adding in the score here. So you have the option to select so if you put early progress. And if you want to add more information, then you can put in a description as well. That why, what's the current situation and uh, 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 why you have marked this as early progress. Similarly, you have sections on strategy and investment. So these are some of the questions that you're trying to understand in terms of whether a strategy is available or not, uh, whether the assessment exercise is done or not, uh, work plan uh, along with the budgets, is it available or not available? And similarly, do you have a kind of a sustainable funding available at present or not, supporting your digital health intervention? Then you move to DHS security and compliance. So we have some questions related to availability of manpower, who can handle DHS security in terms of your servers, your SOPs and everything the ownership of data both uh, the as for the data as well as technical ownership and do you have the key sops in place or not third we have core team for dhs to administration it's just about having internal personnel within the ministry who could handle dhs implementations on their own and availability of sops for system management etc then we come to the building blocks of dhs2 the metadata and the alternates so in terms of what is the quality and for assessment of the quality, you have the categorization and the description given here, which uh, so you can choose what is what uh, what matches to your existing implementations. Then we come to the end users, how well they are trained at the district level and the facility level, and whether the country has a specific training instance dedicated for training use in the country, so that can be evaluated. Next, we come to our denominators. Uh, for data for birth and deaths, population, human resources, so that could be assessed here. Next, we have infrastructure, uh, use availability of computers, mobile phone, uh, server hosting mechanisms, budget for server hosting, uh, mobile device management inventory, uh, all those questions could be answered. So in case any of these questions don't apply to interventions, then you can uh, skip answer those and uh, that doesn't uh, kind of contributes to the overall uh, score then we have the aggregate sections where you could see that whether you're using the dhis2 platform for aggregate hmis if yes then you could say at scale it means that it, it is being used at the national scale if you just started then it's pilot if it is still under development you could put under developments or for this specific use case dhis2 is not being used at all then you can just select not used 
and if it's not used then you can leave these questions blank but if it's at any other stage other than not used then you can answer try to answer these questions uh, some of them might not be relevant but then you can skip those which are not relevant at, as for the present state of implementation then we move into some programmatic focus to talk about data sets uh, the data for aggregate uh, programs for hiv uh, then we talk about uh, dhis2 being the main source for hiv data collection and there are no parallel systems in country standard based configuration uh, the kind of analytics and dashboards which are available and then private sector data community data the completeness and timeliness uh, the whole factors which kind of uh, define your program performance are are available here and trying to understand how is the coordination between the hmis and the technical program staff uh, internally and uh, of course with external stakeholders that can also be uh, evaluated here then we have data use guidelines so the same set of questions are then repeated for the aggregate tb uh, program and aggregate malaria program then we have a section for immunization so if uh, immunization routine immunization is part of your dhis implementation you could assess that using the same set of questions surveillance aggregate uh, if you're doing that using dhis2 then you can uh, assess your idsr program same for covid-19 surveillance because a uh, lot of countries use dhis2 for their covid-19 data management related to surveillance uh, immunization etc so we have a, a section on that as well CHIS, the the few countries which use uh, data for community health as well through DHS2, so that could also be assessed. Then we come to the tracker components, trying to understand the tracker capacity that the core team has in country. So there are some questions on that. And then we move into program specific surveillance, uh, program specific trackers for HIV. We have components for uh, the previous impact assessments, the hosting arrangements, quality of metadata, alignment with the WHO standards packages use of android uh, the, the completeness of case based reporting uh, and whether this data is contributing to routine hmis reporting or not and the data use at facility level and uh, uh, similar uh, questions for tb case surveillance as well as for malaria uh, elimination surveillance as well and then we have electronic immunization registry same set of questions followed by uh, covid-19 immunization registry uh if you're using uh individual tracker for afi uh case based surveillance and covid-19 surveillance and in case your country has done mass immunization campaigns uh using dhis2 then based on the latest uh assessment camp the mass vaccination campaign carried out you can assess this section as well and you could put a quick summary so how it works is uh, and the his group where the his group may help you is so you fill in this tool uh, and score each of the section add your notes uh, there is a centralized uh, database where all this data gets imported and you get some standard reports which are automated and kind of give you a summary the screenshot of which i showed in my presentation so using that you get some outputs trying uh, giving a grade of e to each of your domains for foundational aggregate and tracker so you could see which of these domains are early progress which are mature which are adequate uh, which are adequate which are mature and which are the ones you not yet achieved so that can be your primary uh, intervention areas moving forward so i'll stop here if there are any more questions uh, please feel free to ask on chat and we can respond to them accordingly and in the participants are present here yes dr thank you hello yes this is the uh, interesting tool so this uh, it is based on the we can use this tool to assessment the capacity of the uh, system particular specific for the sector tool or we can apply for the whole uh, health information system um so yeah i mean it's not kind of uh, hard bound to dhis2 but i think it's kind of more generic i think all of them also answer this question right okay so i think the way we designed this was to of course since we largely work on dhis2 the focus was there but then if you want to assess any health information system uh, which is kind of hmis plus program specific you can use the same tool because the principles are kind of common across the information system that we try to do for health okay. so, so yeah. Thank you for this is the the tools uh, 
because of, we cannot just give uh, the uh, answer immediately, so we need to more collective uh, people in, 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 in the team to give the answer. And then the final score will be automatically generated, right? Which area we need to improve. Uh, supposed to be uh, yeah, we will assess of the uh, capacity of the data to now in our country. And so that we can have uh, the system, the, the tool can generate the, which area we need to improve, right? Uh, this is based on Excel or with on? Yeah, so currently this is based on Excel. I think what has been done is that this Excel can be imported into a DHS2 instance where all the calculations happen and you get a final scorecard of the, the majority of testing. There you get area-wise grading of uh, different domains by their status, uh, which are defined here. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, if I think that's a question for that. I mean, if they want to use the assessment locally and not really import data into DHS2, then maybe the toolkit could have some internal calculations to give them an output. Uh, Maybe not an electronic output like you could use in DHS2. So I think I mean yeah, we we will take that recommendation into account and of course. Yeah, because this tool is very really detailed by program and also the uh, general uh, uh, applied in the to countries so that we can use to assess what where it is to improve the system. It is it is uh, is it the governance? Is it the capacity building? Or is it the infrastructure? Or is it the standard? Something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Suppose in our country, we we need to use this tool to assess what we are in the which level now. But, but we know that we already start to implement the digital tool since 2014, like this morning, I was uh, present there. And we apply all the, the uh, uh, aggregate, the event capture, eye capture, and trackers to different programs. Uh, also, including the, the program from Global Fund, like uh, TV, and Malaria in our uh, country. So currently, we, are, we have uh, the team in, the, in, in our department, in the Regional Health. So since the 2014 until now, I don't know for how long it, uh, the system can be handed over to the country so that they can not derive, uh, not any, any, any question, any uh, our program, they can uh, all the time just asking the, the hit, hit P Vietnam to support. I don't know for how long in, in this country so that they can stand that can uh, more sustainable because I know that in our know, country mainly uh, we have we, we based on the like you said uh, we, we have the support from global partner to, to make the system functioning I don't know when when the, the partner is gone how how the government can can continue can sustain the system uh, one uh, one more question about the because we know that uh, all the data is now keeping the cloud server in, in other, other, other countries. I don't know, John told me in, in Pico or somewhere. The government asking me, because I don't know, there are, there are questions about the security. They want to move that data in the, in the country. I don't know whether this is. Uh, uh, we need to move on, just keep in, in that cloud server. So I have that two questions. Thank you. I can't sleep for the, the first question um, about kind of reliance on this group. I, I know this is you know, a growing challenge um, for many countries. Um, I'll, I'll present actually a little bit of an assessment framework that we can use to get a baseline skill set. And, Kind of do some planning around um, that capacity building more long term. So hopefully that'll help a little bit and answer your question later on. For the second question, um, I think this is something you might want to take up with John and Sam so you can have a little more um, advice specifically on, on what your needs are um, for this. It's a difficult question, of course, to answer in many cases. Um, and I know you've been using cloud service for many reasons. I think you know, you've had some challenges before using internal systems. So 
I would suggest you get a little bit more detailed answer from John and Sam, who are more aware of the implementation. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. So just a point to add. So for Lao, I think we're discussing a global fund. So very soon you'll have the same assessment tool that you use. So I think it's that Nam will work with you to assess all these programs through this tool and you will have a... Hi. So there was a question earlier about uh, whether this tool can cover other systems, other technologies. Uh, so when we develop this uh, maturity assessment tool with, together with Global Fund, um, of course we looked at a lot of the other tools that are available for digital health, maturity, etc. So, and we agree that we would focus on the DHS2 aspects and make it like a DHS specific maturity tool. But obviously it links many of these areas like infrastructure, governance linked to the broader system. So there are some linkage in, uh, in here to other maturity assessment tools. I think Global Fund is working also with UNITU, for example, on a digital health maturity tool. And if you already respond to that, I think there are answers here that you can bring back into this tool that so you don't need to do everything twice. Um, but I think there are if you're interested in looking at some of these other tools, we can help to find the references because we used to a lot when we developed this. Uh, but the idea with this specific tool is that it's for the HS2 implementation. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, supplement, we have got two questions. One is the, the whether uh, the government can hand over to home information systems. Usually, even the US government cannot maintain their own system by themselves. Why? Because the, always the technology is changing and technology is always updating. So technical people always like the technical expertise like this. So you, so heading over to government, definitely we want to and we are gradually doing so. But the point is, uh, that is up to certain limit. So if we hand it over DHS2 in Bangladesh, we do hand over to system, they are running quite well. But when it comes to security, uh, specific technical issue, version upgrading or something with complicated issues, then they ask us for help. So that is how you may hand over his Vietnam in future might hand over to you, but you should also in link with his Vietnam in future. So any types of disrupted critical area. So usually government never have his own capacity, even if they have to hire the external experts. Second part, the data security, but in many countries, for example, in Bangladesh, the ICT law says that no data will accept resident outside of Bangladesh. So any data we have to put inside the Bangladesh area. So how? Because if you want to make a data center, it's very costly. Reason. So don't go for that because it is extremely costly and very risky. So better to have the commercial uh, the cloud provider inside your country. That's going be a good solution. You can try with this one. You can explore. But definitely, his system is there to help you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to just add a little bit on this kind of country capacity. I'm sure that we'll talk about it in a minute. But I think the goal for us for the HISP network is that the government take full ownership and have capacity to maintain the system. Uh, so I think it, it will always be a transition. And I think uh, we'll come back to kind of some guidance. Um, uh, recommendations we have in terms of what kind of people, what skill set you need in order to kind of gradually take over more and more of the responsibility and uh, those activities. I think what Hannah was referring to is that it's the same in Norway is that the Ministry of Health, of course, relies uh, on some outsourcing for specific parts. For example, it's very common on the server infrastructure that they outsource to another company or another government entity. But I think what is important is that you need capacity within the Ministry of Health to understand the system, to understand what the needs are, so that you can manage these agreements with a local company or, or some external provider of certain services. And I think that's the, the critical part that you have this kind of gradually um, building more IT capacity, information system capacity within the government. May not be expertise on every single aspect, but at least that's kind of a high level understanding of what 
what are the processes needed, what are the skills needed, and then also be able to manage, uh, if, if it's relevant, manage these kind of agreements with all the companies that can help provide these services. Yes, thank you. So you mentioned that the tool can be used to assist planning and strengthen activities. How? How? Because we want to to get the government team to use the data for better planning and better results. Right now, we are thinking how we're going to do it and what tools we can use to help the government to use the data in the HIS2 to do the planning for the result that they agree. So I can try to respond and then I think we'll probably get back to it later in the session. So uh, yesterday in my brief presentation, um, I had some similar slides around the maturity profile and assessment. And I think doing the assessment and kind of identifying the gaps and the kind of status in each of these components is just the first step. I think the second step is for uh, the his groups together with the government to really review these results and come up with some recommended actions together. Right? And that is kind of important input to a bigger DHI strengthening plan. And, and you can have kind of, through the tool, you can identify clearly which areas, for example, on metadata that need to be addressed or on capacity building, like the core team, for example, what needs to be addressed. And you can also do this assessment on a regular basis every year, every second year, to kind of monitor progress uh, on these areas. So I think um, the tool itself is not like a template for the plan, but I think it will provide very important input to your DHI strengthening plan. And I think in collaboration with the HISP group, uh, you can kind of work on that plan. We can also help, we have other tools that can help with budgeting and some more specific kind of planning templates. But um, first of all, I think it's really giving you the best input you can have in terms of what needs to be strengthened. And then we can also guide you on kind of how to strengthen what are the kind of recommended activities. So each his group, when they do this assessment now on behalf of Global Fund together with the government, is that filling out this spreadsheet is one thing, but the, the second part is to uh, write a summary report where they kind of do their own analysis of the results uh, based on discussions with the government on what are the priorities. They can also recommend in order to, if your priority is to strengthen, for example, the TB tracker, they can recommend that based on the whole assessment, kind of what the status of the foundational area, status on aggregate, they can recommend what are the steps needed to have a successful implementation of the TB track, which may involve improving the server, improving the general capacity, or, or uh, buying more devices, improving kind of connectivity. There's a lot of kind of steps needed to get to those goals, and uh, that's part of this report, this executive summary, that the HIPS will provide some recommendations on how to reach it. And I think that could feed into a more detailed plan. We're also working with Global Fund and Gavi that, of course, are funding a lot of DHI strengthening plans in countries through their country grants. So they're also part of this process. So they, they know the tool and they can kind of recognize the areas that should be prioritized in a Global Fund grant or in a Gavi grant. Um, and I think that can also help them if you need to, uh, to get funding for HMIS. Um, in discussions with EPI program when you discuss Gavi grant, or in discussions with HIV, TB, malaria programs when you discuss the Global Fund grant, that you have this kind of system strengthening and DHIS, HMIS uh, strengthening activities prioritized in those budgets. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guess, can I continue a little bit? <laughs> talking about how we can make the, to support the country uh, more sustainable way of uh, how, we, how we can make this system more uh, long term when all the partners, you know, we know that the partner will be someday they will, they will grow and the government need to continue. 
So yes, we, we are not the uh, political people. We are the patient of the. We have a feeling that uh, yes, all the time when, when the system have a, a program, uh, we need to uh, we need to request this team to support. Uh, either we already build the capacity some of the of the uh, local staff, but they are contractor staff. So we need some some day they also need. When the when the program the project is set out, they also need to go to another uh, job, so they get to. Uh, so we talk about the capacity. So what kind of uh, uh, team that we are going to to build? Because we are we need, we need to we need to start thinking now how many people we need to build the capacity within the within the mental health, because we also have the uh, students in the. Uh, National University of Health Science. We also have people who are currently working in the in the Ministry of Health, but they're still uh, young. They, they can continue. So, what kind of uh, uh, field that we need to start thinking and to put people go to abroad to training to when they, whenever they they finish, they can come back to to hand over uh, uh, with the this team so that they can. Continue to build the capacity, make the uh, system uh, functioning uh, for whenever we continue. Because of the only, because of the thing is that because of the government can only adopt that this is to become the main platform for the Ministry of Health. So now we need to keep the momentum so that we can make it sustainable. Infrastructure we already support uh, because of the government. Because the, the government has a lot of uh, partners to support computer, internet, it doesn't matter. But we just worry about those people who are going to, to, to maintain the system. Of course, we cannot uh, uh, forever rely on the uh, free Vietnam to support. But I really uh, uh, agree with Hanan that we need to, because the other, even though America, they also need uh, some. <laughs> Uh, uh, private sector to get into to, to support the system because of yes because of the the political people minister they didn't understand this structure they said that we somehow we need to uh, make the, uh, our people to to maintain the system but I don't I don't think so that we cannot make it immediately to uh, year or two years maybe it take some some time right I don't know experience in, in, in your country. How we can build the capacity to to people to look at for to continue this kind of idea. Accept that this is a very good tool for us. Thank you. So uh, I think I'll uh, try to address that in my presentation a little bit more, just so you can see kind of the makeup of some roles and how we can support that kind of long-term um, sustainability of, of system strengthening a little bit more. Um, so, yeah. so last June, we had the, the DHS conference in Oslo, and we had a session on very much this topic, and we invited some of the countries that, um, if we use the term here, are mature, that have uh, been using these guys over many 10, 15, 20 years and are very strong kind of in government teams and are, let's say, less reliant on the his day to day support. So we have countries like South Africa, Ghana, and Rwanda, and we, and we challenge them a bit to talk about what did it take to, to become this mature and more kind of self sustainable. Um, I think the, um, the, there were, of course, a lot of different defects, but I think some of the common factors were very much around. Uh, leadership and governance, that you have kind of a long-term plan, consistent plan, focusing on building that capacity year after year, instead of kind of changing path and changing. Um, so there was one good example from Rwanda, where they have, since 2011, been very systematic in defining what is the core team we need, and what are the skills, and then what are the training opportunities. So, sending the right people to academies and gradually kind of building up that capacity and also using the his group to do trainings and build capacity over time i think that over time is really the, the key word here and sure that it will talk about much more about kind of how you can do more kind of specific planning around the capacity okay i think
think we should get started just so we can just see some of the other kind of contributory factors to this, uh, to this maturity assessment. So in that maturity assessment, it's quite long, but even within that, there are other components that you kind of need to look at in a little bit more detail to get the results to fill that in. So even though it's kind of quite comprehensive and you're able to assign scores, the scores need to be evidence-based. So in that case, then we need to actually, you know, perform some other type of kind of legwork to get the information we need in order to assign it a score. You know, it's not just something we can typically just discuss and, and kind of come up with. Um, it requires a little bit more kind of insight um, than that. So I'm just going to talk about three kind of contributory assessments to the maturity um, profile. One is going to be a metadata assessment. So we've talked about data quality um, previously. There's also this aspect of metadata quality, and we'll just also just briefly discuss why this is a problem. problem. Um, we did discuss data quality, and I'll just present very quickly some data quality assessment frameworks and tools. Um, you know, not just all the different features and things like that, but templates for reports and things of that nature that can help you when you're performing these. And then we'll also talk about this core team needs analysis. So this is all about this long-term kind of capacity building, strengthening, and planning for different positions um, within this. And when we refer to kind of capacity building, actually, it extends beyond training, right? These are not kind of interchangeable terms. So there's one as part of this, this human resource planning where we kind of have to figure out what the different roles, responsibilities are, how do we retain, retain those staff, as well as this training component, which is that additional component of scaling people's uh, skills up over time. Okay, so we'll talk about the metadata assessment first. So this is basically just looking at the quality of a configuration, okay, for the most part. So we looked at data quality, and we can think about the same thing for our configuration. Let's go a bit quick. I'll post all these frameworks and tools online. So when we're talking about uh, the, this metadata assessment, there's really kind of two, two ways we can look at this. So one is reactive. This is when there's a problem in our system and we need to assess it. And for most mature systems, this is where we are. It's been going on for many years and we have all kinds of things configured in our DHIS2 configuration and we need to kind of figure out what these problem areas are. The second is proactive and this is better both for new systems as well as these old systems when we fix them. You know, how do we stop this from happening again? Okay. So in that, uh, so if we just talk about the reactive measure first, because for most mature systems, this is typically the process that we have to undergo. Um, we have some tools built, built inside of DHIS2. We have built a specific tool um, for this. Um, and then we also have some manual review procedures. Um, not everything can be automated. So why do we have to kind of look at this and kind of what effect does it have? So I just listed a couple points here on the various types of, of individuals it might affect. You know, for the end user in, in particular, you know, um, we had some mention about data use and it's been a common theme for many people that I've talked to. Um, it really creates some confusion when they go to create data outputs because they're not able to get the data they need, they're not able to find the indicators they need and then, you know, all the values that they're looking at, they can't really trust them so much, right? Um, also, anytime they want to disaggregate those outputs, so by male, by female, by age, by any other particular disaggregation, this can often create a lot of problems. And just even accessing those items, they might not even see the indicators that they're supposed to have access. Okay. Um, and then on the data quality side, there's quite a lot of problems that can result, uh, create data quality issues. So looking at any long-term trends over time, um, if you're trying to figure out your completeness um, and that things are unassigned or assigned incorrectly, um, you know, there's, there's just a multitude of issues, many different issues that can result uh, from this. Then from the administrator side as well, there's a lot of problems, you know, that can So I just listed some here just to give some food for thought. But, uh, you know, this configuration, these four kind of configuration principles, can have a kind of wide standing waterfall effect on your system and increase a number of different challenges. So here's an example, just quickly, of an assessment um, that my colleague Olaf performed um, some time ago. And he was just kind of looking at the analysis. And in the system, there was all these dashboards. Most of them had, never, I mean, 50% had nothing on them. Almost 90% of them weren't shared with anybody. So you know, no one could utilize them but the single person that made them. We had a couple shared with individual users, 
And then there was all kinds of other problems with the way things were grouped. So it was very hard to find anything in the system itself. So, you know, um, you know, if this is kind of how things are set up in the system, it makes data use very challenging. So one thing, of course, is understanding the data, but if you're not even able to make a basic chart or graph or map, then you're going to have a lot of trouble being able to then interpret that information. So this is kind of how all of those other challenges that we talked about can cause this, this issue with the kind of problems with the metadata configuration. So we've created this tool. Um, I'll, I'll just show the tool in a second. Um, basically to help us assess the metadata in the system. So I can just open this one. And I'll just pull it up. Okay, so we've created this tool basically to help us perform this assessment. Um, so because before it's kind of difficult to assess some of this configuration on our own. Um, so we use this against DHIS2 instances. It can be any instance you have, your malaria instance, your HMIS instance. It's good to actually assess each of your instances separately just to make sure that you know there's no shared problems. And if there are, what do we do to fix them? So we get this kind of summary report um, for this. And there is a number, um, I'll scroll down. You'll see there's a number of kind of issues that we identify. Each of these comes with a uh, level of kind of priority. It also comes with a basic description and it also identifies the number of issues that are within the system itself. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. And some of these are a little technical, but you know, don't worry about that. It's more about the principle. So you can see for each issue, we have kind of a level of, of criticality, if you will. Some those that are marked the most critical are maybe those that usually need to be fixed um, as soon as they can. Okay, we, we give a number. Um, in this case, there's none in this system. And then we give a description. And we do this for each of these issues. So it's quite a detailed report. Um, but the idea is for someone to kind of filter this out, right? You shouldn't really present this to um, you know, any decision-making body or any type of partner agency. But you would work through this and kind of write a summary of what your most critical issues are. You know, you want to triage those and prioritize those that are most relevant um, to you. Of course, you'd want to document all of these problems because you, know, you might want to take care of them at some point, but uh, you know you really want to have some some mechanism to review this and make sure you can prioritize and evaluate them effectively. Of course, then fixing these is, is another challenge. So we offer this tool, and and uh, you know you can get a little support in running it um, on your system. But once it's set up, I mean you can get the results fairly fairly quickly um, and, and review it together um, with somebody. Um, and you know we offer this. Uh, it, 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 it integrates. Um, all the automatic checks that I've talked about. So this includes these uh, data integrity checks inside of DHIS2. You can run it at the same time if you want, along with all these additional checks that we've added um, since to kind of give us this automated report on the configuration. And it will look at a number of different aspects of your system. I apologize, I'm going a bit quick, I know. But I, I've posted this example report um, inside the Google Drive, um, so you can have a look at the full details of the report. And see um, all the different information it contains. Some of it's a little technical, some of it's not too bad. Um, we'll see, for example, uh, there's a lot of words maybe about not everyone will recognize, but some are all about the, the analysis side as well, like dashboards that haven't been looked at, charts that haven't been looked at in years, data sets that have no data. So things like that, you know, most people can recognize. Um, and yeah, we just use this to kind of support our assessment of metadata, of course, for the maturity profile. But of course, this is also something you can run fairly routinely on a development system, kind of assess the health of your overall configuration. And uh, you don't want to end up where many systems are right now, where we have uh, you know, so many issues that it's kind of overwhelming um, to manage. Um, but of course, you know, that's something you can still help with. Um, but uh, you know, if you run this kind of routinely, just like a data quality check, checking the health of your system, and then when you see kind of some of these pop up, you can take care of them. You know, they, they will happen, these things do happen. You just want to kind of try and get ahead of them as best you can. Okay, so we also have this other side of things, which is this proactive um, side. And uh, this is more about kind of preventing those challenges from happening, right? Um, so this is procedures, training, kind of mitigating measures we can implement. Um, either before or after, right? So you might find those issues 
fix them all, and then you don't want them to happen again, right? Or you just might be starting from scratch and you just want to implement the best practices you can in order to prevent those things from happening in the first place. So I'm just going to take So as an example, we have some um, SOP standard operating procedures available um, that you know give some guidance on you know considerations to make to prevent these challenges from happening um, in the first place. So we're, we're still working on packaging these appropriately. I'm, I'm happy to share this example with you, of course, um, but we're still working on kind of writing several guiding documents about all of this. Um, to basically prevent some of these challenges that we identify via the assessment from happening in the first place. And this is kind of the next level of, of kind of implementation support because, you know, in academies and things like that, or, or even local trainings, you know, you'll kind of learn where, where you click and, and, you know, how to do something inside of DHIS2. But this is much more about coordination procedure and following something that you can implement at scale so you prevent some of these things from happening. So as an example here, this is for adding aggregate metadata, and there's all kinds of information on category model, on data sets, um, on user groups, sharing, things of that nature. Um, this is an example with specific groups, but uh, it's just a template that can be changed. Um, so, so we do this uh, in order to kind of prevent those things from happening in the first place, and making sure, of course, people, the whole idea is that this helps people access their data. It's really not just so we can have a clean DHIS2. Of course, that's great. But really, the end goal is to support data quality and data use and make it easier on users to be able to access the information they need. All right, so when we perform this assessment, especially in mature systems, large systems, um, the number of issues is kind of, it's often too much to deal with all at once. So we need to kind of prioritize the issues that were identified. So um, as an example, I just listed some issues. I'm not going to say the exact issue, but let's say we have a handful of issues. Oftentimes, um, experienced implementation um, team members can kind of advise you on what is a higher priority versus maybe what is something nice to fix, maybe a little time consuming, and you can kind of park it for now and come back to it later. Of course, you want to document that, like I said, so you can come back to it when it does need to be fixed. But you know, the idea is to prioritize this because you will often find some, some quite critical issues that need to be taken care of and that can sometimes be challenging to fix in, in and of itself. Um, and then also with these procedures that I mentioned, it's often a good idea then in response to those most kind of critical issues that you've identified to try and write some of these, you know, I'll share the procedure with you for one aspect, but it's often a good idea to kind of write some of these procedures, help the team um, perform some training on implementation of those procedures to prevent these issues from happening um, again. So here's kind of the just overall process um, of the assessment from start to finish. Um, it can take a little bit of time, can be quick, it just depends on the results and you know how organized everything is um, within the setting you're performing this. Um, but you know you want to make sure you involve the relevant uh, team members and keep them updated at the beginning, define the scope of the assessment. Um, then you kind of have to identify the extent of all these problems. Um, that's through you know, some of these tools that can help you with that, as well as some of these manual review processes. I didn't talk about that, but I can share some information on that. Um, you want, want to make sure through this whole process that you're continuously presenting these findings back. I can't mention kind of the intervention of external individuals, especially if an external support is helping you with this. You know, it's a good idea that they're continuously updating you on the progress internally so you can present this back to whomever um, you know, needs to know about all these things. Um, through that assessment, then you want to kind of identify strategies to mitigate these problems. That can be very challenging. Right now, we're still working on some toolkits to help countries um, implement some kind of detailed mitigation measures when they find these problems. We don't have all of that as yet, but we are working towards um, you know, building some more kind of detailed tools that will help um, countries to solve these problems. Of course, we have some kind of um, small areas where we can offer um, support, but uh, we are still working on that and hope to have some more information on that soon. Um, you know, then you want to kind of prioritize these and then implement those um, on these systems and of course present back your findings. And you can run the assessment again as kind of a, a pre and post evaluation, of course, noting that, uh, you know, if you've implemented something that should be fixed, 
it shouldn't pop up in the assessment anymore. So it does help at both ends of the spectrum to kind of give you, you know, check on your results. And like I said, it's something that you can run routinely um, with respect to help system. All right, so switching gears a little bit. So I apologize if I'm moving around a little. But uh, so the next one I wanted to talk about was a data quality assessment. And um, this is now looking at the data itself. So before we were looking at the configuration, now we're talk touching on the data. So within the maturity assessment, the framework that Sora presented, actually reviewing the data itself is not a requirement. Um, but I think overall, it's just the general health of the system. It's a very good idea to obviously see the quality um, of that data. Um, so in the maturity assessment, what you're looking at more is procedures and uh, having forums for discussion of data quality. Um, but there are many other areas where this type of assessment should be um, performed, especially if you're performing any training on data use, because then you can really be confident with your data in your data if there are issues with its quality. So what do we typically want to assess when we're performing a data quality review? So we can look at it at two, two different ways. We can perform a rapid assessment, and then there are some things we can do very quickly, regardless of our system, at least in my opinion. Okay. And then there are more detailed assessments um, where you can add on some extra components, and that can take a little bit more time, but it can give you a little bit more insight into your data quality as well. Right? So we can use a number of DHIS2 features to assess this. You know, of course, there are other tools as well, but DHIS2 can really support a lot of this. Um, and I, I have a, a presentation that I shared earlier this morning, uh, earlier today um, on this. Um, but these in, in particular, the reason why they take a little bit longer is because you may need external data sources of some kind to support this. So the outcome of these assessments, you know, that's a little more challenging to define. Um, often the challenges with data quality that we see routinely are a result of challenges at the lowest level of data collection. Um, sometimes it can be very simple, maybe it's just a simple data entry error, but sometimes it's more serious where you know, health workers might not actually understand service delivery guidelines and are misclassifying services for that reason. And in that case, that's a more serious area where you know, other interventions will be needed. Um, but you know, after you perform this, it should also help with some kind of generating some discussion around implementing, for example, some of the EHIS2 features to support routinely reviewing data quality. Because probably if this is being done and the results are challenging, maybe the data quality hasn't been looked at in a while. Okay. Um, also drafting of, of things like manuals to actually use these features, the training guidelines, as well as standard operating procedures, which is you know, how often should the data be reviewed, who should review the data, how does the data get changed, you know, all those other kind of small things that, that, that kind of seem small, but if no one is assigned, um, then it doesn't really get done. And then of course, you know, at the actual training of staff in both the process as well as the tools. So um, as an example as well, I will upload this template. So this is an example of a template report using some of the DHIS2 tools. There's also some guidance at the top just on kind of setting things up before you perform the assessment. Um, and this is just for a rapid assessment. This is not for an extended long assessment, but just some concrete guidance on you know, how you set things up, what's up, what are some typical measures you can look at, how you might want to frame your report, and what type of recommendations you might consider making. Of course, this is just a suggestion, but I know it's often hard when you're staring at a blank page, where do you actually start, right? So it's not really meant to be copied word for word, but it's meant to give you a sense or an idea of you know, what type of information you could produce um, when you produce, uh, or sorry, when you perform this type of review. Okay, so I'll, I'll upload this and it has, a, I mean, it is a template, so you can, there are areas that you can replace, Um, I, I try to give, I notice, yeah, here it is. It's just not highlighted as well in this PDF, I guess. Um, some, some kind of distinct suggestions of where these various measures should be run as well, like what level of your system. 
um, we should look at just to account for this uh, issue uh, brought in before this issue of sensitivity um, where maybe facilities are, are the, the value at the facility level we won't really see it at maybe a higher level of um, so i make some suggestions as well so this is just to kind of help us assess our data, uh, our data quickly and of course like i said there can be more detailed review as well to support the process Okay, so uh, this comes back to Chance Lee's comments. Uh, now we're moving on to the next one, the, the core team assessment. So I apologize, I have a lot of different assessments and tools that I'm presenting very quickly. Um, but like I said, I will share them all online. So um, this concept of a DHIS2 core team, it, it has been around for, for a very long time. Uh, and actually, Laura can probably speak to it better than me. Um, but uh, what we're kind of mentioning here is when we talk about this, this idea of a core team. So, so what is it actually? So we mean that it's kind of a combination of experts, both within and outside of, of the government, that are responsible for overseeing the DHIS2 implementation across all domains within the country. So within health, for example, it doesn't mean just the HIV program or the malaria program. You know, we're looking at kind of an integrated system with people who can kind of support these different program areas. And of course, you can have program staff support um, that as well, but you really want this kind of overarching um, contribution system-wide. So we suggest that these core teams are, are there in every country, you know, uh, um, really because we want these countries to build the necessary technical capacity to maintain their DHIS2 implementation over time. Okay? And the assessment of this core team capacity, that's one of the blocks in our maturity profile. So this directly contributes to the results of that tool. And it's of course useful for many. So we've tried to together identify a couple key roles um, that are within this DHIS2 core team. And where we can, we kind of, um, you know, some are optional, maybe some are uh, maybe less priority at the beginning and more so required to get things moving. Um, so we've identified these different uh, staff that can kind of contribute to this core team. So this includes uh, what we call a DHIS2 operational lead. I'll explain each role, uh, or at least one. I'll pick one and try and explain a little bit more. Um, DHIS2 implementation experts who are working on the configuration and maintaining DHIS2 over time. I think I have security listed twice. Sorry about that. Um, someone looking at security. Um, trainers. And this doesn't mean one distinct person per role can have someone share, of course. The implementation person might be also doing some training, for example. Okay. Um, a server administrator. Um, subject matter experts, so people who are knowledgeable in the use of the data, um, whichever domain you're looking at, or whichever health program area as you're looking at. Um, program managers um, that are actually responsible for kind of managing projects, uh, budgets, etc. Um, and uh, app developers. Now, this is optional, um, one of the optional roles. Okay. So, what does this core team actually do? Okay, so they support the DHIS2 implementation overall, right? And there's many different functions that they perform. They interact with users, sometimes even you know users in the field. Um, they help design the actual DHIS2 um, database. Sometimes they act more in a role uh, of helping to harmonize indicators, look across various data sets, forms, um, um, individual registration um, uh, pieces of paper, um, all the kind of different workflows that are available. Um, design reports help you support the creation of dashboards. Um, they can also support the, the maintenance of DHIS2. And so this is all the configuration, um, the, 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 all the server um, components, hosting, um, integration with other systems. We, we will have a session on integration tomorrow. Um, cleaning up the database, as I, you know, we talked about this metadata assessment earlier, upgrading DHIS2. Um, they perform capacity building. This is a big area, big effort, right? For training end users, training staff um, in the field. And, and of course we have the DISC network and they're just meant you know, to support these local teams to implement these actions. Okay. So, so what are we kind of, in this kind of area where we're trying to assess the, the core team, um, what are we actually trying to do, right? So this exercise is kind of trying to outline the gap between current skill sets and the, the, the required needs. 
right? So maybe in your mind, kind of the requirement is so they need to do everything, right? But we need to break that down into smaller components and understand, well, what are the specific skill areas they need to uh, build on? And, you know, where are they right now? Because we need a baseline to make sure we can develop a training pathway or training profile for that individual, you know, that will actually work in practice and not just be kind of scattered and, and selecting topics that we want them to learn about, but they might not be ready to do so. We need to do it in a, in a good way that makes sense over time. So we have a, a tool for this as well, and I'm going to explain both one of the roles that I showed earlier, as well as a tool at the same time. Um, so for each role in the core team that I've described, we have a detailed list of skills, and they're assessed on a scale of one to four. There's a description of what each of these mean, but at its most baseline level, one is the lowest skill level, four is the highest skill. Uh, and based on this assessment, we can identify areas that need specific attention. Um, there's not really any recommendations that are given necessarily, um, or scores uh, so much, uh, you know, based on the different uh, areas. It's much more about, you know, where are your priorities, right? And now that you understand where those skill levels lie, and maybe even you're missing people, uh, you're missing entire people that should require a, a certain profile, you know, then, then what do you kind of do from there, right? So the idea is to develop a, develop a structured training plan, right? So we often kind of, when we work in this area of training, it's, it's kind of a little um, ad hoc, right? So we will, there'll be a request for a training or there'll be projects with certain training um, aspects tied to them, and we will go ahead and implement those. But really what we're looking to do is kind of look at this at a much broader view with a much longer timeline, um, knowing that by the end, it'll be much more sustainable than you know, where we are right now with this some challenges. Right? So scores that are one or two, you know, they might need specific attention. However, they might also be kind of lower priority. So, so what is the outcome of this, right? So when we finish this, what are we getting out of this? So we have to review the assessment results and decide what are the priority areas for training, right? And also human resource development. So we should not separate these two concepts because capacity building, often when people say capacity building, they only think about the training aspect. But it's also actually tied to the people that are there. We need the right people, we need mechanisms to retain them, to evaluate their skill set, to make sure they're managed appropriately. Okay. So as an example, there might be entire roles where no one has even been identified to perform them, and therefore no current skills exist in the country. Right? In that case, what do you do? Do you select someone that you're going to have uh, those skills built over time? Do you select someone new, maybe? that you can start from the baseline and build their skill set over time. And so there are some considerations here to make. So I'm just going to explain. Okay, so what we tried to do for each of those roles that I've identified on that list um, is create a profile of sorts. So this includes kind of a, a description of what they do, some of the typical work tasks that they will do, some of the qualifications they will have. We're still working on this, and I apologize, everything's kind of in this draft state, um, but we're, we're trying to kind of finalize this, right? So as an example, I've just taken one role. This is the DHIS2 implementer, and, and written a job description for them, the okay, scope of work, terms of reference, and it's meant as a template, right? When you're also to give people background about you know, in more detail, what does each profile actually contain? What are the kind of typical tasks they would do? Uh, because then we also kind of have, then the next step is, is this assessment of skills, right? So as an example, we take each, each uh, role that I've identified in that slide deck, and we build out a profile for them in terms of what are the typical operations that they would perform in order to give everyone a better sense. So it's not just the listing of the roles, because that is often, you know, not enough. It doesn't give us the information. Um, these still need to be reviewed a little bit, um, but uh, you know, then we have kind of as much as we can example work tasks. And I say examples because this doesn't mean this is exactly what they're going to do. Maybe it'll be changed a little bit, especially with input. You know, everyone has to kind of review themselves um, internally. What are the actual tasks this person's going to perform? There's different contextual considerations. You'll have different experts who also might contribute um, to reviewing these and making changes. So we try to kind of be as detailed as we can, not to be overwhelming, but much more to provide a menu um, of various items that people can select from or people can get an idea from um, when they're trying to kind of figure out 
who do we actually bring in to do this work? Or who's the right person? Because I think another thing that, which I'm also trying to kind of explain, is, you know, you're not really looking for the perfect person with all of these qualities. You're really looking for someone who has the potential to get there. Right? Because that's kind of unrealistic to expect someone to have all of these things from the beginning. Right. So for each of those, uh, and I'll upload these as well, um, for each of those roles, we've, we've created a, a profile. It's still draft, so I apologize, um, but uh, I will upload those so you can have a look at them to get a better sense of what each of those, uh, the role types represents. Just, just one So similarly, for each of the roles, we've also developed this baseline, um, what, what we call a needs assessment. Okay? And what I've done is, uh, in this tool, we've listed all the roles. Okay? So all the same roles that I talked about, all the same roles that we have profiles for, I've gone ahead and kind of listed out a number of different skills that this person should have. Okay? And whether they exist or not, okay, that, that's one thing. If they don't exist, of course, you can't assess those skills. Um, but if they do, you can kind of go through this assessment and once again, so for each item, I know it's a bit hard to see, but uh, the tool is also online. Um, it's a little bit more, um, we pull up this, this source from one to four, and it's described for each uh, area. What does that actually mean? So if it's not achieved, well, what does that actually mean for the person? If it's early understanding, uh, I still have to fill in for some of them. Okay, so these are the categories we have, not yet achieved, Early understanding, adequate, and mature. So it follows a similar kind of wording as a maturity profile, a little bit different. Um, but then we've also provided explanations for what each of those categorizations means. So it can help you to kind of um, you know, assess the skills of this individual. And then we have each of the different kind of just quickly skills and then the, the, the kind of more detailed description. And this is related to that, that kind of skill profile that we created for each job. So the idea is to kind of go through this and assess the, pe the person's skill um, and kind of see where they are, right? And it's not meant as a judgment, area of judgment, I will say, right? It's much more meant to give us a baseline. Where do we have to start from? If this person, for example, this program manager, right? Um, they're not able to understand, you know, anything about basic budgeting um, for DHIS2. It's not a criticism, but that's something that might need to be worked on quite a bit. And where do we start? From there. So like Ola said, there are some, some more tools we can provide here. And of course, we can provide some extra guidance and advice. But if, if this person is very mature, very comfortable budgeting DHS2 implementations and understands all the inputs that are required, you know, that's probably an area you don't need to focus on so much, maybe compared to some of these other areas that are listed. And for all these profiles, we have a similar arrangement. So for example, this, this implementer, this role pro profile that I pulled up before, same thing. We have all these different skills. Can they configure aggregate? Can they configure tracker? Can they work with data quality? Right? And you know, depending on where they are, where they fall um, in, in those areas, we can help, you know, can help you identify some of these priorities. So this is meant as a tool to really give you a, a much more structured way of assessing the skill set of the ministry, right? And it's a way to document this, and of course, you know perform this evaluation more than once but this is really meant to be fed in then to a larger training plan okay so not something that's uh you know something that you could build over um, a couple of years where you can take this person and walk them through many different areas and also you know it helps provide some evidence where you are now and some justification as to why you're requesting maybe you know maybe you're requesting that you have someone come and perform some type of training in your country right it, it helps to provide that justification to say well you know, we've done this assessment of their skills. They're really, uh, there's really some areas that can be strengthening, and we've identified some of these key areas. Right. Okay, so that was very quick. I know I jumped through many different tools. I apologize for that, um, but I will end the presentation for now. Um, if there are any questions, um, just feel free to ask. And we're happy. Thank you very much for your time. If there are no questions, we'll end for the day. If there are questions, just feel free to ask.
I guess you can tell the online people that they're done. Tomorrow we'll use it. Thank <laughs> you.